everyone. Welcome back to Musky Town's Tying with the Pros. On this episode, we are going to focus on one of the iconic patterns in musky fly fishing, uh, the Buford. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, and if you are just getting into the craft or, you know, maybe you've seen it and you haven't heard much about it, the Buford is a mashup of, let's call it an evolution of Bill Catherwood's giant killer. Uh, that pattern uh, came to be decades ago. Uh, then Lefty Cray came in with his deceiver. Uh, um, Bob Popovics had, uh, you know, his bulkhead deceiver and, and looking at this fly as a, a kind of a, I've heard it called an unkempt bulkhead deceiver. So uh, we're going to get, you know, a little bit into the theory of tying this pattern and then different scenarios where you'd want to fish it. Uh, but the Buford's a, an incredible pattern for moving water. Um, I know some folks will fish it in still water too. Um, but the way that this fly swims, it is built with a big bushy head that when it you strip it and it stops, the fly turns and picks a side. And, you know, in, in still water, I look at that as a little unnatural because it would just turn and stop. And really, you know, darting bait fish do kind of turn and maybe they'll glide a little bit. So uh, this is a pattern that uh, really belongs in every musky fly angler's box. Hook, we're tying on a six aught Kona big game carnivore. Um, it's got a nice long hook. Uh, if you like, you know, let's say, uh, you know, various spinnerbait hooks or um, some other hook, whatever you have, uh, you don't necessarily need something like this. But um, when you're tying a larger single, uh, which we're going to be doing here, um, the shank space is really nice. Uh, another hook I really like to tie on, maybe not for this pattern as much, is the Gamakatsu B10S. Um, reason being is the shape of the shank taper falls down, the, the bend is a little bit shorter shanked on this uh, in comparison. So just kind of holding that up there, seeing how much more room you have to work with uh, with the Kona. But uh, Kona big game carnivore six aught. Um, we're going to be using flat waxed Flymaster Plus. It's a two tendonier flat thread. Um, tying with um, I've got a few different bucktails. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, whiting schloppen bundles. If you have strung schloppen or something like that, uh, definitely works. Uh, and, and often that's what I'll tie with. Uh, for the sake of this, we picked out some some feathers in advance just to not have this be a two hour video. Yeah, I guess we can jump into bucktails. So. We've got a few different kinds of bucktails here on purpose, and I'm going to just try to describe these things and show them a little bit in the video. Uh, but the purpose for having different tails is when we build our profile, each of these uh, each of these bucktail fibers need to behave a little bit differently. In the tail, I'm using nice, long, consistent, um, crinkly, wavy tail. Um, there's not a lot of hollow in the butts to this, and you know that'll achieve the length that we're after. Um, as we move forward in the fly. Um, I'll be using a tail that's got a little bit more hollow to it. Uh, and it's got similar uh, characteristics around, you know, nice consistent wave, but it's got a little more hollow to hold a profile in the middle of, of the fly. Um, and then as we get towards the head, I'm going to be switching to uh, this. I have this tail out just for this one. Um, it's got really nice hollow fibers. See, they snap back like that. Um, those hollow fibers will flare around the hook shank uh, to help us get that Buford head that we're after. So, that's bucktails, thread, feathers, and then flash. I'll be using a, a lateral scale. Um, I really like this 1 69th inch uh, lateral scale. It just, it, it seems really it, like it gives me good depth on the shank. And it's, it's a flash that I, I use quite a bit in natural um, color profiles. So I don't think there's anything else. Let's dive on in. Oh, and then uh, I, I, the only other thing I have, I have a, a grizzly hen saddle. Uh, and I like to use these for the pectoral fins on this, but we'll get to that too. We're going to repeat a, a few different uh, themes as we move uh, through these videos. Uh, building a profile with a single uh, will be one of those uh, length. Uh, so when we do this, we'll use our longer fibers in the rear, and then we'll slowly shorten our bucktail and open up our reverse ties as we move forward, tapering into the head. Um, with a single, I like to cap singles at nine inches. So this fly is going to be right at nine inches long. So let's go ahead and tie our thread base on. We start at the eye and we work our way back. I, I spun my thread first. So we get those nice ridges to lash our materials onto. We tie back to the bend of the hook.
And we usually don't go past the bend of the hook, reason being if you were to try to tie your materials here, they're going to point down. It's just kind of an unnatural material, uh, unnatural uh, profile. If you were doing something like that and it was for a reason, you know, maybe you found that, you know, it helped your action dive down and, and that was something that in your fishery worked, you could do that, but uh, not something that I usually do. Um, and I'm off the top of my head. I'm not sure anyone really does, but um, there's always a time and a place for experimentation. And on your, your thread base, if you don't want to go crazy on your thread base to the eye, um, having a little bit, uh, having a shank that's more on the, the bare side as you move forward uh, in the fly, especially when we put our, our Buford head in, is going to help that material spin a little bit better. Uh, if you do want to tie your thread base all the way up, you can, uh, but, you know, thinking about what we're going to be doing here, you don't have to. And be careful not to clip your thread on the tip of your hook. It will happen. So we're going to get our, 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 our bucktail that we intended for the first tie-in of this fly. And I won't use this tail again. Uh, that is one thing as you are building out a bucktail collection. Um, those nice long tails, you don't need to use them for everything. Uh, they'll last a lot longer if you don't. Um, I particularly like to use, you know, tails that have these nice, you know, call them six inch or so fibers or, or five, four, five. You don't need massive length on these, but if you have it, the tail tie-in would be the time to use it on a single. And make sure that when you're cutting those hairs, you cut them right at the base of the hide. And you'll notice this is a recurring theme. Anytime we're, we're working with bucktail, we'll go ahead and kind of pinch really hard with one hand and then we'll work out those under hairs. And once we've gotten all those out, you don't have to clip them off and make them flush at all. I barely took any hair off there, but you can if it makes you feel better. Two nice loose wraps. Then we're going to slowly take our left finger and just put a little bit of pressure as we pull down on our thread and that's going to spin our hair around the hook shank and I will turn my vise in a sec just so that you can see that we got that nice even coverage. Uh, where my broad can go. Got that nice even coverage on the around the hook shank. Uh, if you're new to spinning bucktail, uh, you, and especially when you get to the heads, you'll notice that sometimes if you're not careful, your, your hair won't spin evenly. Um, that's something you'll get better at as you tie. Um, and it's a good thing to practice if, if you, if you want, but my favorite way to practice is just tie a lot. And I didn't count wraps there. If I was, I'd usually do five or six to lock in that first clump. Uh, and then I pull these butt ends back. Uh, a lot of these different techniques and steps are going to be repeated in these different videos. So if I ever glance over anything, uh, definitely run through our other videos and you'll probably pick up what you need. Um, if you don't, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help with those questions. So when we pull our butts back, the reason for this on the tail tie-in is we want to lock that tail in. Uh, you know, muskies and, and these toothy fish like pike are... Uh, notorious for shortening the life of a fly. Uh, so I like to overbuild everything. And, you know, if, if you are fishing primarily for muskies, it's not a bad idea to do so, um, especially if there's other ESOCs in, in those waters. So we got all of our, our tail fibers locked in those butt ends too. We have a few different feathers. Out. I was going to strip these out before we tied them in, um, but wanted to share um, that process, just to, especially if it's the type of thing that you haven't done much, but I'll take my right hand and I will hold, I've already measured. I know, I know these points on my vice, um, and, and nine inches is right about there on my vice. Um, and I like to go a little short of that and have my flash extend a little bit longer than my feathers. Um, I've just noticed good results with that. And uh, a number of the people that I talk fly tying theory with also do that and have had incredible results. So if it ain't broke, So the first step I'll do, um, if we wanted to strip all our feathers out, we can, but just go ahead and tie that in nice and tight.
And especially with these whiting schloppen, you'll notice that a lot of the stems are twisty and different depending um, on the feather, which is okay. It just takes sometimes a little bit of extra work to make sure that your feather is aligned on the shank, uh, on the orientation that you want. And I'm looking at my feathers right now. I intentionally, I, I wanna make sure that the feather is gonna behave in the profile like I want. Like this feather will work better on the side than it would on the top of the shank because it has a natural curve. And you'll notice that a feather doesn't always do the same thing when you turn it back and forth. Um, again, being particularly granular on what it is we're working toward trying to do, not because you have to do it this way, but uh, understanding how different tires are looking at these different steps will ultimately help you become a better tire. And we're going to put quite a few, uh, uh, quite a few, we're going to put five tail feathers on this fly. Uh, this is going to be a lemon tail, but you know, we could do all sure truce feathers on the tail of this if we wanted to. Um, I'm not going to for a couple different reasons. Um, contrast probably being the biggest one. Um, I like to have fly. Uh, when I tie with different color combos, what I like is for a fly as it moves in the water to look dynamic and different um, as part of what triggers an eat from a following muskie. Um, and they are picky. I mean, the reason there are so many follows in musky fly fishing is because they're waiting for that perfect profile turn so that when the fly turns, they can hit it at just that right angle where they know they're not going to be wasting energy um, come time to eat. And we just piece our way here. Um, lining up the ends of your feathers. If you want to line up the ends of your feathers, you can. If they don't, it's not a big deal at all. Um, I will typically like to start with maybe my first two side tail feathers lined up, and then I'll gradually work the tip of the tail feathers um, forward in the pattern just to have a little bit more um, of kind of a natural tapered profile in the water. Uh, and, and that's personal preference. Uh, one of the patterns that we're going to be doing in February is uh, Justin Hokinson's War Pig, and he cuts the flash flat at the end of the fly. I know a couple tires who've done stuff like that, and uh, they catch fish. So this is just, you know, one of those personal preference things that if you're fishing in really clear water, I feel like makes a little bit of a difference. But, um, you know, no matter how much musky fishing you do, um, just given the way that they behave in the water, sample sizes are limited. And, you know, if the purpose of anything is to increase your own confidence in the fly while you're fishing it. Make you focus a little bit better when you're on the water. So if I just try to tie this one in right now, uh, this feather would wanna rotate because the, the shaft of the feather the, is vertical like that. So we just take the flat part of our scissors here and we pinch the feather like this. And it'll rotate on you, so you might have to fuss with it a little bit. So that stem was less than cooperative. Uh, sometimes they do take quite a bit to get where you need them, um, to get them flat so that the feather is going to orient itself the way you want on the shank. And just so you can see what that looks like, the purpose of that is I want that feather nice and broadside flat on the top. On the first three feathers, each of those stems, so if this is the shank, and we're just gonna repeat this a little bit. Um, for the first tail feathers, I will tie right on the side of the shank. Um, but as we move forward with our next set of feathers, we'll actually tie in across. You'll notice those feathers curve inward. 
we'll tie across the shank so that we get increased uh, width in our, our fly. And if your preference while you tie is to do, you know, if you wanted to put this second set of, of tail feathers in these, these white ones after your next bucktail clump, you could, um, you'll notice on our, our river pig video that that's exactly what we did was we had a different set of feathers as we advanced. I personally like, depending on the pattern to do things a little bit differently, but um, this next set of feathers is tented on purpose um, just to increase width. And as we get everything where we want it, just use our materials clip or your hair clip if you're using one of those on your vise. And whereas when we were tying the feather stem flat to the vise, we really wanted to, you know, we took the time to pinch that feather stem so that, you know, it was, it would sit flat on the shank when we tied it in. Um, when we're tenting feathers, we actually want that, um, we want the stem of the feather to have that, you know, flat opposite. Whereas, you know, if you try to tie it in flat on the shank, it would rotate your feather. But because you're tenting it, if this is your feather and your stem has this, flat profile like this, it ties in really nice when you're tenting like that. And again, taking a second to get your, your feathers where you want them because when we're done here and we are done tying those feathers in now, um, I like to glue everything in for increased durability. And all I'm really doing when I glue here, I'm not putting some big glob because it's gonna to take too long to dry. Um, I'm really just making a nice little bit of, little bit of that super glue right where the thread uh, is wrapped over the top of the feather stem and maybe back a little bit onto the feather stem to reinforce it. If you're using strung schloppen, I've got a, a piece here to, to illustrate the point. Strung schlop, it'll have that where they pierce the stem to string it. Those stems will break and get weak sometimes. Uh, I like to tie past that break sometimes. And if you need the extra length and you don't tie past that break, um, I will put extra glue or UV just to try and reinforce, reinforce that feather stem. And once our feathers are tie in, tied in, we just advance our thread just enough uh, so that we're gonna do our flash. And, you know, I don't use a ton of flash uh, and I'll kind of reiterate that there, there are exceptions. If I was tying a fly that was specifically gonna be used on a, a really cloudy day, um, then maybe I would use a little bit more flash or maybe not just a little cloudy. Maybe it was a very windy day or, or the water was rough for whatever reason. Um, and the reason being is, you, you know, you would want increased visibility in, in those types of scenarios, but, um, there are different waters where the stain in the water is different. And, you know, yes, this is going to be a white and chartreuse fly, but, you know, if you're in tannic water, maybe it's just a little bit brighter. Colors change and disappear at different depths in the water column. So, you know, all that to say, there's a reason why we fish all these different colors. Um, it's not because a fish necessarily sees chartreuse and says, all right, I want that chartreuse fly. It's because it looks like something different to them. So same way I measured my feathers, I measure my flash and take the long side of the flash toward the front of the fly when we wrap it around our thread. And when we pinch it and rotate around this way, what happens is that longer side of the flash goes on the underside and ends up here. Um, and when you're measuring sometimes, when you're measuring sometimes, you'll notice that 
maybe your flash didn't go quite as long as you intended it. Just, you know, there's, you pass it off and change hands. Um, we're not tying that first tie in so tight that you can't adjust it, uh, which is exactly what I just did right there. So I'll usually do um, a couple wraps if I have to adjust it. If, uh, if length was good right away, I would have just, while pinching, I would have done a couple semi-tight wraps and then advanced my thread. And then uh, again, we take our nails here, like the finger tip of your fingernail, and we're just distributing that flash over the top of the thread. So it starts kind of in a, a straight line. And when you take your finger and you, you mush it, you're, you're coating the top of the fly around the feathers um, just to you know, support having good flash around the entirety of the profile. And when you get it all where you want it, just give it a, a couple extra wraps just to lock everything in. Three wraps, lock it all in. I did a couple more there just because trying to talk through, not just tying. So after we do our first section here, um, I'm going to end up grabbing the next tail in our, this is the medium hollow tail. Um, it's got similar length. It's going to be a little bit shorter than the first tie-in that we did. And that's just building out that belly. Um, and we'll go shorter and shorter and hollower um, toward we, the, as we move toward the front of the hook eye. And uh, by the time we get to the hook eye, especially on a Buford, I'll be using very, very hollow hair um, because that is the hair that flares. Um, anyone who's seen someone tie with uh, deer hair, that is the reason why deer hair uh, is used to create these flies with these really dense profiles and stackments because when you cinch it down on the shank, that hair goes and it stands up. So. So that first tie-in, uh, I, I didn't say this when we were doing it, but that first tie-in is right around a half a pencil width. If, if you have a standard number two pencil or you know a big pen, um, when you kind of when you slightly compress that hair in your fingers, you get a rough sense for um, the depth in comparison to that pencil. So if we did a, a half or so pencil on the first tie-in. Um, this next tie-in will be just a little bit denser than that. I won't say two thirds of a pencil, but um, between half and two thirds of a, a pencil width. We do the same thing. So you got our ends lined up there. We just pick out those under hairs. Sometimes, you know, different tails will have a little bit of oil in them. Um, so maybe a little flicking will help you get those hairs out. But um, once the hair stops coming out that way, uh, you can pinch it and move on. So on this shank, we're going to have a, a plenty of space to this. When we did the river pig, I, I, we did that on a uh, four aught uh, round bend gamma hook. Um, we have a longer shank to work with here. Um, so you'll notice that we went with slightly hollower bucktail for this tie-in. Um, we're going to do a regular tie-in on this one and spin it. And what will happen is that will automatically open up a little bit wider than our first tie-in did because that hair wasn't as hollow. And then for the next tie-in, we'll use the same hair, um, but we'll reverse tie it, which will allow us to control uh, how flared it is on the shank. But it gives us that next step of opening up the profile and building out, you know, that bait fish shape that we we know muskies like so much. So again, I do this because I'm extremely particular. Um, and sometimes when I'm like messing in my hands, the fibers don't line up. You don't have to do this at all. Like you can just tie it on. Uh, I will use a, a hair stacker uh, just out of nothing but personal preference. Uh, you do not have to do that. Uh, I, I am admittedly over particular. Um, part of that, again, and I just did the same thing there where I just kind of zoned out. But when I get my hair ends lined up, we tie them in. Um, the reason that I am so picky about this is because uh, this is a customer fly and all of these flies need to swim, in, in my opinion, as best I am capable of making them swim uh, in the way that I've seen that happen. What works best for me is to make sure that everything is as, as close to in the round as possible. And in the round means not just hollow tying, but um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're not tied in an angle. You're going to want to make sure when you do your head that it's as close to a, you know, 
concentric circle as you can. And the reason for that is as you swim this fly and you strip it, um, you're not just stripping, you know, randomly, you're actually swimming that fly. You're, you're going to be in tune and, and noticing exactly how, you know, different levels of snap with your wrist or pull or strip length or timing between your strips, how that impacts the way that the fly swims. And uh, especially when you're fishing with uh, your fishing buddy, uh, talking through, okay, I'm going to do this. And, you know, maybe, are you, what are you doing? And you, you kind of go back and forth and that'll allow you to dial in on a given day in different conditions that much faster so that, you know, you're, you're more successful while you're fishing. So before we tie this one in, um, I'm, I'm spinning my thread again because we want it nice and strong. Um, and we've got, I don't want to say quite a quarter inch of tag end on this bucktail, but two loose wraps have, a, you know, between a quarter and eighth inch, give it a little bit of pressure. And then as you pull and wrap your thread around, it spins and covers your shank. Um, and nothing wrong with using your fingers to help that around. Um, you know, there are flies that when you're tying, everything just clicks. Like you, you, you know, you, you spin the hair, it does exactly what you need it to do. You don't have to touch it and you wrap it. I mean, there's, there's been Bufords that I've tied that in bulkheads where you finish the head and you look and you're like, I'm not even going to trim that. But there's other ones that need some extra love, whether that's, you know, helping your hair around the shank or maybe, you, you know, when you spun your head, things were uneven and off and you had to trim it a little bit extra to make sure that, you know, there was a, the same amount of hair around the head so that it didn't favor a side while you're fishing it. Um, but we're going to use that same technique we use to lock our fibers in on the first tie-in. Um, again, five or six wraps to get the hair in and then take, you know, a third to half of those bed ends, hold them back. Um, if you're not careful and your thread gets flat and you pull too tight here, you can definitely break your thread. Um, so just pay attention and, and thread tension is something that as you advance as a tire, you will um, be more aware of and better at. But if you do, uh, if you do break your thread, uh, and I want to finish tying this stuff just before I share this. Um, one of the first fly tying classes that I ever went to, um, was with Jeff Faulkner in Maine. Uh, we used to live out there. And when we we're tying this big, uh, I think I want to say it was a, a pike pattern that he ties. I don't remember the exact name of it, but um, I broke my thread. And I thought that, okay, well, I need to unwrap this and redo these steps. And, and I, I tell you this because when you're learning to tie, that's not what happens. If, if, if my thread were to have broken right there, depending where I was in the step, sometimes it'll break on the shank, you know, sometimes it'll break, you know midway through your tie-in but usually if your thread breaks don't overthink it take your thread and just like you're putting your thread base on wrap right away wrap over the top of where it broke wrap back give it a little bit of extra if you want to hit some glue on it so that you feel better about it you can do that but um it's kind of, i remember the first time that i broke my thread and i'm in this class and uh the owner of the shop walks up behind me and I started to go, what are you doing? And he wraps his thread back on the shank. And it was just one of those funny learning moments just because, you know, there, that was a lot of flies ago, but I'm sure that there's someone else who is going to break their thread at some point and go, oh God, what do I do? Well, that's what you do. It's not a big deal. So we're not going to put flash on between every step. Uh, I'll usually do it um, after every three. So this next one will be a reverse tie again. Uh, we're going to be, a, if we want to go towards two thirds uh, a width of a pencil again on this, we absolutely can. Um, there is no need to get, if you get too dense, it's going to be heavier to cast. So there's a sweet spot between sparse enough that it still casts and fish well, fish as well, um, but dense enough that it still holds a profile. And you will get a feeling for that. Um, I'm describing, you know, okay, half a pencil width for the first time, a little bit more than that for the next one, um, a little bit more than that for the next one. There will be times where maybe you're running out of shank space and you don't have room to do, you know, a denser tie-in, but because it's so much closer to the previous tie-in, that same effect of building density um, more so as you move toward the forward part of the fly, you're still achieving that uh, piece so that you get that, you know, intentional walking erratic, you know, up, down, side to side action that you're after with this pattern. And I'm trying to add as much color as possible while we, while we tie this uh, to try to give context to um, 
whether you're just starting to tie or you're someone who's tied for a really long time, if you have questions about anything that I'm saying or uh, any of our tires saying is say as we go through the the video, ask. Uh, the way that we get better as a community and as individual tires and anglers is by asking questions. Um, don't be afraid to put yourself out there uh, so that you can learn because if you don't ask, then it's going to take you that much harder to that much longer to learn and you may never uncover that secret that allows you to excel as a, a tire and an angler. Everything we're doing on the vice, we're thinking about what that's going to do in the water as we go. So um, thinking about whether, you know, that's what, okay, my box has a bunch of really sparse flies or a bunch of really dense flies. I want to be able to cover this fishing condition that I haven't already. Well, maybe I'm going to visit a location where pink and white works really well, like Wisconsin, or maybe I'm going to go to Tennessee where I've had a lot more success with chartreuse and white or, um, you know, a fishery where the water's crystal clear and, you know, the weather's supposed to be really nice and clear. Well, I'm going to tie a pretty sparse sucker with just a little bit of flash because I want to be really natural in that fishery. And um, it's something that I don't think they're going to have any issue seeing it. And, you know, too much flash would actually be counterproductive toward that fly being successful. So thinking about what it is you're trying to do while tying uh, will absolutely help you be a better angler. And uh, so now, same thing that we did before, two nice loose wraps because we're going to spin this, but this time our reverse tie has our butt ends facing toward the bend of the hook. Um, we get that tied in, put just a little bit of pressure with that left thumb, and then as we tighten our thread and spin around the vise, everything comes around for us. Um, and nice even coverage. One other part that you can do, and this is a, if you want, but don't have to do, uh, if as you move forward, by the time you get to the front of a Buford, you're gonna have, uh, you know, head size is a subjective thing. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that as you tie more and more, uh, the heads on the front of a Buford will probably get smaller over time. Um, you don't need that big a head given the density of the material to swim the way that you're after. And it's a little more natural uh, with the profile to have a head that's an inch tops on a single like this. I and mean, you can get down to three quarters or half an inch depending. And, and you know, it's still gonna swim well. Um, but the butt ends, so I have, you know, maybe just over a quarter inch of butt end on this part. And I will usually be pretty consistent, you know, right in that quarter, you know, eighth to quarter inch range, moving my way forward, just in butt end, butt end length. But because you're increasing the head size, if you wanted to get thicker with your, um, with your butt ends and, you know, maybe go a little bit, maybe it was a little over a quarter inch of, of tagging on your bucktail in the next tie-in, you could do that. Um, again, you don't have to, but just if you're thinking about that, okay, I want to fly that's got, you know, this bushy wide head. And as I move back, things get narrower and sparser. That is what helps you control the hydrodynamics of making sure that your fly does do the, the darty side to side up and down thing, as opposed to just every once in a while you'll tie a fly. And, you know, especially as you're learning, um, you go to swim the thing and it just kind of just it's a bit of a dud. And that happens sometimes like that. You'll go back and say, what did I do? What, what could have been better? Um, what could have made that work? So I just grabbed what was closest to me. And I, I, I have a, a bunch of different tools here. Um, but let's just go in order of what your options are. The easiest thing to do is using your fingers. Like when you reverse tying, you're going to want to push this material back and you can literally just use, you know, three fingers around the hook shank push, and then you grab control of your material and you, you know, start doing your thread down. If you, you know, if maybe you don't want to use your fingers, um, a pen is what I tied with for years and a pen works really well. I just a hollowed out clear pen and it allows you to get just a nice easy hold of your bucktail before you start tying in your reverse tie. Um, the next step up from that is a tool called the Proto John. Um, I really like the Proto John. Uh, I don't use it often, usually, unless it's for um, jig hooks. And the reason being, and I'm going to try to get this tight in the video, uh, there's a groove in it right here. 
that allows the eye of a jig hook to stick out um, and still let you get some help to get your material captured. Uh, often you use your fingers. Um, this tool also has these, I'm gonna try to show it, these little grooves in it to try to help you control the bucktail fibers as you're doing it. And these are all nice to haves, uh, not completely necessary. Um, and then one of my favorite new tools, and this is something that um, it just, it, it's, it feels really nice in your hand. And it's, it's, purpose built for this. Um, it's a Minnesota fly tool. You can see everything in there, but it accomplishes the same thing. Um, and that's just to say that you have options. Uh, these are, the more time you spend at the vice, you know, the more opportunities there are to upgrade certain pieces if you want. I mean, I'm tying with a, I think a $12 ceramic bobbin um, today, but there are, you know, adjustable options like this Smain one. It's, you know, I think it's a $70 bobbin and it's got you know, this nice little knob that allows you to control tension. Um, the, another option is like the, um, the right ceramic bobbin. Um, and this is their Magnum. And it has a, a wheel that allows you to kind of click and control your, your tension in a, a similar manner, albeit not as fast. Um, so all that to say, you have options. Um, and if you are someone who likes to use what you have and, and you don't want to do all these upgrades, you definitely don't have to. All those tools, let's go ahead and use our fingers. Uh, we push back and when we capture our material back like this, you'll notice that often um, you'll have one side of the, you know, the material be a little bit forward. And if you were to just start doing your thread dam there, um, maybe that side would go down further or out further. So before I do a thread dam, I always like to just take a second and kind of mush my material back on the thread just to make sure that my tie-in is in a nice even circle, not at a diagonal around the shank. And then once that's where it is, um, I want to reiterate this step just because I've seen it a few times recently and I cringe a little bit each time, but um, hollow tying technique, there is, my, again, my personal preference, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Um, I've seen a few folks tie back on top of their material in this step. And you can tie really fast that way, but it doesn't give you the control of the taper that is gonna help your fly swim as well as they can in the water. And when we're fishing for such a picky species like muskies, uh, you want every edge that you can possibly have. Um, so when we reverse tie, we advance our thread in front of that clump, and then we take an extra second. And, and this step does take a moment. So we're, we're kind of going back and forward and, and you'll see you'll build a, your thread dams, I got a triangle shape. It'll be as its widest point up against the thread. And then um, the reason we don't just tie it all in the same place, like right here against the thread is because eventually that flat thread would separate and roll off and you'd have to go back and fix it anyway. But you'll notice that that taper is something that you're controlling and will Keep on going. And the reason we're holding our material back is because we're trying not to wrap fibers around um, the shank as part of our thread dam. Um, if you do, and you don't wanna waste your time going back to fix that, uh, certainly a personal preference thing, and you can do that. And so I started to build a little bit too much bulk right there in the same spot and my thread dam rolled off. So you just kind of roll back down and then wrap and we'll go back down We'll stop. And you'll notice that we're closing that taper. And this does take a second to do. And that's part of why I talked about, you know, if we're talking about an optimal way to tie a thread dam. Um, my purpose is, okay, achieve this as close to perfect profile as I can and make sure I get the swimming action. If you wanted to tie back on your material and you were less concerned about controlling your profile shape and taper, uh, why you're doing what you're doing definitely comes into play there. There's a reason why so many tires over the years um, since Bob Popovics came out and said, this is how you tie a hollow fly. Um, tie this way. And it's, it's for good reason. Like the fish do care about the profile, you know, in order, what do they care about? They care about size first. They care about profile 
they care about action. And then color is a, a distant kind of last thought. Um, not to say that it doesn't matter, but you have to get their attention in the first place and um, the size of the fly and, you know, what, you know, what these fish eat in a different fishery um, is definitely the place where you want to start. So you'll notice that we're kind of inching our way to that profile being exactly what we want. Um, this is still a little more open than I'm after for this fly. Um, and we'll go, um, we'll go open like that on the next tie-in, but um, I'm just gonna do a few more wraps on this thread dam. And it's a pretty big thread dam. Um, I've definitely noticed that, you know, when you're dealing with a little bit more material and uh, the material is a, a bit more hollow, like this clump is that we just tied in, um, it takes a larger thread dam. I'll try to see if, help you see that. I mean, that triangle is pretty big on the shank. It'd be quite a bit of thread. Um, And the reason I mentioned that is just, you know, especially if you're someone who hasn't done a lot of reverse tying um, and you're saying, oh, well, am I, am I doing this right? You, you probably are. Um, and if you're not, you know, I mean, heck, take a picture, send it in and ask. And if, if there's something that we can help guide you toward, then, you know, happy to do that. So that one's all done. We've got room right now for one to two more uh, reverse ties before we get to tying the head section. Uh, one of the things I've found uh, when I started tying Bufords to now is that uh, I would do the heads way too big, not just too wide, but I would typically do like three sections of bucktail to tie them in. And there's still time and a place for that, especially if you're like mixing different colors in your heads and maybe you wanna do like two tones where you've got a different color on the bottom and top of the shank. So as I'm keeping track of space on the shank and moving forward in the fly, um, most of my Bufords these days will have two clumps of bucktail or even one really fat clump of bucktail. And um, the difference between a bulkhead or a Buford ultimately comes down to the amount of material that you have in the head. So uh, say for instance, you had a, a thick clump of, of bucktail before you started your head tie-ins and your thread dam ended up being much larger than you intended or thought it was gonna be. And maybe you didn't have a lot of room in the front. Um, that's okay. Like grab an extra thick, you know, extra thick, we'll, we'll get into uh, thickness of clumps as we get to the head here, but um, grab a little more material and do that single section um, for your head tie-in. And, you know, that bulkheady, bufordy in between is, you know, that's, that's where you really want to be. I mean, that's when flies swim best. I mean, you get that turn, you get maybe a little bit of bulkhead glide to it too. Um, but, you know, unless you're a production tire, definitely make it a point to intentionally include different, um, different versions of your patterns. Like if your goal is to say, I want to tie a dozen flies and I want every single one to look the same, like you'll become a better tire for it. Go for it. But if your goal is to have variety for when you're on the water so that, you know, say you start in the morning and you have a bunch of pretty dense flies and it's overcast and really windy in the morning and you're, you know, you're out there fishing and you, you need to make sure that your flies have that extra visibility, then um, all of a sudden the sun comes out and it gets really clear and calm. Well, you probably don't want to fish that same bulky fly with a ton of flash that you've been fishing all day because that amount of, you know, that amount of flash is may or is probably going to be really unnatural in the water um, when things get clear and sunny out. Uh, now, if the water is still stirred up a little bit, there's some leeway there, but um, having different options in your fly box uh, is something you definitely want to do, uh, especially if you're a solo angler. Like if there's two of you in there and maybe you both have your own boxes uh, fishing, then you're going to be able to say, okay, well, I'm going to fish something like this, or maybe you usually fish you know, sucker patterns. Well, I'm going to fish a little denser one. I'm going to fish a slightly sparser one. This is, you know, the type of retrieve I'm going to use and you do this and um, you'll dial in that much faster. But, uh, you know, I do a lot of fishing by myself and with anglers and it is a noticeable difference in how quickly um, you're able to dial in when you're fishing with a friend who you're, you're comparing notes with compared to when it's just you and, and 
having those different options come the time to make an adjustment, you know, you're doing a leader check. You, you came out, even if you maybe threw a bad cash or loop didn't turn over, check for a win knot, make sure there's no dings in your leader. Just look at your setup, check that your hook is sharp and say, right before you cast it back out there, do I want to keep throwing this? Do I want to change it? Uh, just taking that extra second to make that decision will absolutely help you be a, a better angler and have more success while you're fishing. I'm pretty happy with this profile here. Um, in the water is this, you know, when you swim this, you'll notice that profiles slim down as you fish them. And maybe, especially when you, you start tying, maybe you thought that you liked a, a narrower profile, but you found that once you fish it, it just turned to mush, right? It turned into an eel, not a minnow pattern. Um, you'll get a sense for, okay, this, you know, these fibers are nice, you know, they're, they're opening up as we move forward. And, and once this is fished or, you know, if I want to shape it in the sink, um, those materials might relax a little bit and give you that more rounded um, teardrop profile. But this one's where we want it. We're going to do our next tie-in. Um, we're working our way up. We want to make sure that we still have that hollow in um, the fibers that we're tying with. If you were to go too far up on the tail or maybe you grabbed the wrong tail and you weren't paying attention, say you had a hollow tie-in here, um, and then you had something that was less hollow here, the result that you would get in the water is that, you know, that rear hollow or op more open tie-in might act like a parachute and your fly might not swim the way you want it to. So again, just trying to share extra context for what you're trying to do as we move forward on the shank. So if we were half plus a pencil width here um, and we want to be, you know, a a little less than two thirds of pencil here, um, you know, but you just wanna make sure that you're getting a little bit thicker material on this next tie in too. And I'm getting a little bit um, shorter barely as we, we move forward on the fly or as we move forward uh, on the shank and, and on these tie ins. And again, I'm going to measure what we're after here. I really like the length of that. The thickness is exactly what I want. So when we get to our next tie-in here, um, we're going to have a little bit more than a quarter inch, same amount of tag-in that we had. If you want to go a little bit uh, longer on the tag-ins, you can, but um, my bucktail length here is such that I want right around the same. Um, one point I want to make there is, and we'll leave that nice and loose right there. Um, if so, when we did our river pig video, we had some hairs that had hollow that extended further up the bucktail fiber. Um, that allowed us to have a little more control over. I want to cut a little bit of length, and you know, I have the perfect length and have still enough hollow to control the profile. Um, the bucktail I'm using today has good hollow for about. I would say maybe, may, not quite a half an inch. So if I were to try to cut this hair, I would change how it behaved on the shank. Um, and that's not something you necessarily want to do. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and your ability to gauge that and, and how each of your different bucktails differs um, will increase as you tie longer. But I wanted to mention that because we had a couple of times where we said, well, don't, you know, you don't necessarily want to cut your bucktail, but we had the right tails to do that last time. Um, when you don't, you just, you're going to want to be specific about making sure that you're choosing the right length of bucktail from the get-go off the tail. So same thing as last time, uh, we are just rotating our way on the shank, give a little bit of pressure to help that around. You'll notice our hair spinning. I usually do five or six wraps. You'll notice on one of our future videos, uh, when we start uh, diving into different articulated patterns that when you do the thread base on an articulation, um, sometimes your thread is flat. And if I were to go and try to do this, you know, as you know, a forward shank on a, a, an articulated fly, there are times where having that sixth wrap and locking it all in, um, maybe the difference between your clump sliding or not uh, as you put down your um, thread dam. Um, and I'll try to remember to 
um, point that out uh, in some of those future videos. But um, if you ever do, you know, you had tied your, your rear section on a fly and then you go to tie your, your front section um, or one of your forward shanks and you start to tie your thread in, like you'll notice that sometimes that, that section will kind of creep its way back. Uh, that is part of why when we spin our thread and we do a, you know, a ridged thread base, we want to make sure that we're really locking things down. Um, one of the other options you have is, especially for those first tie-ins on a new shank as you move forward in a fly, I'll tie a little bump sometimes before I put the next section in so that it really has nowhere that it can slide to. Um, but yeah, a bit of a side note I wanted to mention. So just like we did before, So just like we did before, we will get a hold of our, our tail material and everything's nice and even around the shank here, uh, which is going to make sure that this fly swims well. If if you ever get to this stage and you feel like you know one side's maybe standing up higher than the other, uh, just know that you can tie and you know keep moving forward, but you may have to spend some extra time you know doing your thread dam on one side to push one side down as opposed to just focusing on that nice even thread dam. Um, and there is nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're gonna end up with flies that still swim well. Um, it just might take you an extra second to get everything to behave exactly like you're after. And so we have a lot of material on this tie in here, uh, which means I, I, I'm expecting that we're gonna need a pretty big thread dam. You notice we work our way back up against those fibers and then back down, um, really focusing on controlling our hair. And I'll just let go of this material in a sec just so that you can see the impact of what we're doing here. So you'll notice that our, our you'll notice that our thread dam is controlling that profile. Um, one thing I did here, and it's good to point this out just because if, you know, whether we're thinking about things just while we tie or not paying attention, there are times when this happens um, where, you know, I tied this thread dam a little bit like this. So this side stands up a little bit more. Um, you don't have to like undo it or anything like that. You just do your next part of the thread dam like this and you'll even that out. So uh, I, I bring that out just because you will have times where you don't do it perfectly. And that's just part of being human. And you, there are easy ways. So I'm not just tying back on the same time. Cause if I just continue to tie against the hair like that, nothing will really change. Like I might have one side of the dam that's too compressed and the profile doesn't stand out like I want. Like I really am focused on making sure that each thread wrap passes on that dam where I want extra pressure to bring that material down. And then I will on the opposite side, maybe not quite be up against the bucktail just because I'm overall trying to focus on that one part of the taper. And you'll notice we've got that nice bait fish profile. bellies forming and we'll continue that all the way up to our head ties what we're gonna do is we'll put our flash in we'll put one more section of feathers and then we'll have room for two uh, buford tie-ins uh, for the head And as your thread dam gets bigger, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is your thread will want to slide down the dam. Um, twisting our thread is also really important for that because if we, you'll, you'll just notice that your twisted thread has less of a tendency to want to slide down. Um, yeah. So really happy with this profile coming together the way it is. Uh, we are going to yeah, we'll do our flash first and then we'll put in our pectoral feathers. And again, in the tail, I maybe used eight strands of flash. Uh, 
we can be pretty consistent here, but because that flash wasn't doubled over, um, this one will be. So we don't want to grab eight strands again because then we'll have you know 16 strands when this is folded. Um, I grabbed five strands here. And the same way we have been, I'll measure before I do anything here. And then I'll pinch my midpoint and I'll actually mark where I want to cut my flash so it's the right length. And then the same way we did before, we'll grab our ends of our flash. Just give them a little bit of edge so they're not exactly even. I mean, I'm trying to see if you can see that. Yeah, they're not all exactly the same length. Um, but this time, when we this time when we wrap our thread or when we wrap our flash around our thread and double it over, uh, our ends of our flash are pretty close to the same side. The, the side that is closer to the hook eye, um, I will typically have just a little bit longer than the side of the flash on the side. And that's because I want that same uh, taper. And again, this is overly precise, but in trying to make sure we illustrate that taper and you know what you get as a result of that um, i wanted to just emphasize it and we'll include a picture of this fly at the end again um, for each fly in the series so that you can see what it is we've done and, and you can see what the end result is so we get our flash where we want it give it a few more wraps and advance our thread So now we're going to do our pectoral fin. Um, we're going to tent these again, uh, but I, I think one of the things that I wanted to point out with our pectoral fins is the length of them. So I will typically try to do a pectoral fin that is just a little bit shorter than the uh, bucktail tie-in before it. Um, and you'll notice I have a little bit of a, a bare patch on my saddle where I've taken a lot of those feathers out. Um, but when you get the feathers that you're after. If you don't have the perfect length on your saddle, let's, let's pull a couple that are just a little long out. And I know these are long and that's fine. The same way that we measured our length before, we do the same thing. You just strip that stem a little bit and that gets you what you're after. Um, now we are gonna need to pinch that feather again um, with our, the feather stem with our scissors again, just to make sure that um, everything ties in how we want it to, but these feathers are a little softer than the, those schlop and bundle feathers and they'll cooperate a little bit better. So the same way we tied our feathers in before, we're going to tent these and twist our thread. We'll do the same thing on the other side so you can see. I'll usually do the feather closest to me first. Um, reason being, if I were to do this side first and then I went to tie in the feather on my side, as I, tench as I tighten everything, if I wasn't paying attention, that feather could rotate further than I would want it to. Um, so there's a reason why I tie that one closer to me first. And we'll lock all this in with super glue again too or head cement. Um, and again, that's something I do. If it's something that you don't want to do, um, by all means, skip that part. Um, pectoral fins are the, are the same thing. Like I, I know plenty of, of musky anglers, especially guides that are tying and have clients the next day um, who don't take the extra time to do those steps. Um, and that's because when you've been fishing all day and you know you had to gas up for the next day and you're getting ready to go again the next morning at 4 a.m. Uh, you may not want to take that extra time. You're, you're just like, all right, that's good enough. I want to fish it. Um, and if that's the type of tire that you want to be, that's completely okay. So we'll go ahead. We'll cut our feather stems nice and tight. And we'll use hard as hole. I really like hard as hole. Like uh, super glue is 
super glue is great. It, it really just depends what you're in the mood for. Um, I'll use super glue sometimes if I have a stem that I feel like needs to be supported a little more, like we talked about the strong schlop and example. Um, but yeah, we are right now at the front of our shank, we have, I would say about an eighth of an inch. Uh, and this is, a, I'm happy that we have this distance because I had a couple tails here um, that we could use for this part of the fly. One of which, they both have really nice hollow fibers, so one's a little bit longer. Um, a lot of times I'll notice that, especially when someone's first learning how to tie a Buford or, or again, some people just, this is personal style, uh, but you'll notice on some Buford patterns that the fly just kind of, you know, you've got this nice profile and then boom, head, and it doesn't necessarily mesh into the rest of the body. Uh, the way that you can make it mesh into the rest of the body is to find fibers that are hollow, but a little bit longer for your first uh, Buford tie-in. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So when it comes time for our first head tie-in, we'll call it our neck tie-in, um, we're, there's two things we're focused on. We're focused on the length of the profile and making sure that, you know, we're, we're in line with that. We went a little bit shorter than we were in the last tie-in. Um, but then we're also thinking about the length of the butt ends and say we're going to have an inch wide head. So half an inch of material. I don't want this first head tie-in to be shorter than the front head tie-in. So I'm making sure that I have mm, three quarters of an inch of hair here. Uh, and the next one will have about a half an inch of tag in, but that way we don't have this bare spot on the neck of the Buford. Uh, so again, our thread's nice and spun. We have uh, two nice loose wraps tying in regular here. If we were doing a hidden bulkhead, for instance, we could tie in reverse here and tuck that in, but we're not. Um, and you just put a little bit of pressure uh, to help that spin nice and evenly and it did get a nice e nice even materials coverage all the way around the shank and while you're spinning through here just kind of shake just to make sure that your thread's not getting hung up on any of those fibers and again five or six wraps with that nice spun thread and this is a spot where i really do like to use a tool of some sort um, with your fingers you can use your fingers and that's fine um, but i've found that it's easier to make sure all of the material stays nice and even uh, to use a tool. So uh, we're just gonna use our tool and push that back. Again, I'll use the tool like I was using my fingers before, just make sure that everything is nice and even on all sides of the head. And what we wanna do is we wanna be a little careful to, as we move our thread, sometimes when we're holding our hair like this and we move our thread forward for the next tie-in, um, multiple hairs, especially if a really dense head, multiple hairs will sometimes get stuck. Um, if you're tying with deer hair, I, I know some deer hair tires will actually use their, their bodkin to kind of part the Red Sea so they can pull their thread through without issue. Um, but usually if you're holding your material back in a Buford and you're just careful, you kind of wiggle it, you, you just are trying to keep material from getting trapped. So um, I'm not going to go crazy here with wraps. Like I, I am using those wraps at one level to push against the head to hold that fiber up, but we don't need to overdo it, uh, especially because on this head, we are going to have um, one more materials tie in. So I'm pretty happy there with uh, that first head tie in. So now I want to get my short my short hollow hairs, because I really don't care anymore about preserving the taper. Like I'm really happy with how consistent our, our taper is. And if those materials stand up a little extra, um, as soon as you get them wet, like your, your profile is going to be nice and consistent. But uh, for this next one, we're going to, I want about the same amount of hair on this one. Um, I will probably aim for just under a pencil width. And then when I pull the under hairs out, uh, that will end up being about a little more than three quarters of a pencil. And again, cut nice and close to the hide. And I'm gonna show you here. So if you look, when I pinch this material, you'll notice there's a bunch of like 
cut hairs and, and sometimes you're working with a, a bleach tail sometimes you know for whatever reason those hairs aren't consistent the goal is of flicking and, and pulling and doing this kind of under for part is make sure you get that even spin excuse me make sure you get that even spin uh, but then also uh, making sure that everything bonds to the shank well when you tie it in um, getting all these little hairs out of the way will will help with that. And, and just as an example, if if you have ever tied the tail end of a fly, and I'll, I'll make sure we point this out in one of our next videos. If you've ever pulled a feather from the hide and, or, you know, from a saddle, for instance, there's kind of a sub feather on the back of the stem. If you don't take that out and you tie it in and then you pull that little feather out, your feather will pop out pretty easy, even sometimes if you glue it. So you're achieving the same thing on a Buford head by getting all those under furs out of the way. Um, and there were so many under furs on this one that I actually ended up with a little bit less material than I want um, for the head here. So I'll just go back and get a little bit more. And yeah, sometimes materials get cut, you know, while, while tails are being processed or, you know, for any other number of reasons the you know, sometimes if you're using a dyed bucktail, maybe the hairs will get burned and shortened or, um, but taking that extra time there. Okay. I got all the under stuff out. There's still some fibers in this one that didn't want to come out. Take the extra sec with our comb. So I will use a bucktail stacker here or a hair stacker here. Um, I'm not using this one, but um, I really like the new Loon Ergo stacker um, because my stacker uses two separate pieces. Um, and there's times when your bench or your tying desk or whatever you're tying on gets a little bit uh, out of control and having to look for a part of your stacker when you are just trying to keep moving forward in the fly is kind of a pain. Um, but Loon one uses a magnet. Anyway, I just thought it was a cool innovation. I, I like the instructor to use. So our ends are mostly lined up here. I've got a couple that aren't. Um, And you'll notice um, different tails will have different amounts of oil. And sometimes uh, uh, white tails especially aren't always as well cleaned as you want them to be, uh, depending where you get them from. And if that happens, sometimes it takes an extra second to make sure that your ends all line up. So we've got that nice, a little bit more than uh, three quarters uh, of an inch, uh, or of a pencil, pardon me. And then we had done our first uh, tie-in of the Buford head. So what I'm gonna do on this next part is there's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, the easiest, so when I was learning to tie Buford heads, I would actually like hold the material and then I'd like pinch it in the other hand and it gets a little bit clunky. It's challenging to do it that way. Um, a much easier way to do it is to, when you get the length of hair that you know you want, you will actually hold it in an angle to the shank in front of you. Um, and I'm going to try to, yeah, you'll hold it at a 45 degree angle in front of the hair, and then you'll make sure that you're capturing that with your two loose wraps and you'll bring your next tie into the back side of that shank and you do the same thing. Um, and then you do the same thing you were just doing. You start to slowly pull and it, you know, give that some pressure and help it spin around. But what happens is you get that nice, even spin all the way around your Buford head. And I got really nice even coverage on that spin. I'm gonna just, I see it looks like might be a little bit more material on the top. Um, you'll notice too, uh, as you're tying these, cause we all have, you know, different amounts of hook shank left on the front. If you're running out of space and you try to do one extra um, clump on a Buford head, it definitely happens. I don't recommend it. You can use a tool like a, a, a fugly packer 
uh, Pat Cohen came up with this. It's an awesome tool for deer hair work, but you know, you can push the material back. Um, what I don't like about that is you do increase the risk of damaging your thread and having something break. Uh, but the point of why I brought that up is if you don't have a ton of space on the shank and you start to wrap, what will happen is the hook eye will get in the way and that material won't always spin. So that's a time where it is highly encouraged. If you need to help that material around, and, and I'm going to do this just a little bit here, just to, for example, but, um, you know, you, you can do that. Um, I, I don't really need to do it a ton on this one because this one ended up spinning nice and even, but there's plenty of flies where I'm tying and they do. And even then, um, assuming I had enough material to start, if it doesn't spin perfectly even, you can just trim it a little bit extra on that side and you're going to ultimately have the same effect of a, a, a Buford head that's nice and even all the way around and, and, you know, does the whole erratic, you know, different direction um, swim when you're, when you're fishing it. Um, so same thing here. We were at three wraps, I think, four, five, six. If you let your thread go flat here while you're doing this step, there will be tails where, um, well, there's two ways you get this. Sometimes if you have your thread goes flat, it will be hard to get your head profile to like mesh together between two tie-ins. Um, but you'll also notice that um, if you have the wrong type of material, like you'll notice that I took material off the side that was hollow on the bases. Um, what I'll often do and usually do is I'll actually take these hollow hairs off the lower part of the tail. Like these are really good for making Buford heads, um, especially the dyed versions that come on your different, your different dyed over white tails. Um, but if you have a tail and you'll get a feel for this, that is less hollow. Maybe the, the hairs are really fine um, and they don't want to flare. What will happen is if you have that in the, maybe your first tie in and then you try to do a second, they won't like mesh well together for, you know, that nice unified Buford head look. Um, I can't stand when that happens and it definitely will happen to you. So if you are having any difficulty uh, tying a Buford head or, you know, uh, a bulkhead or, or something else where you need your bucktail to flare in a certain way and it's not doing what you're expecting, um, definitely reach out, ask like, Hey, I'm trying this. Am, am I doing this right? Is it, send us a picture of your bucktail. Is my, does my bucktail look like it's hollow enough for this? And uh, sometimes your technique is just fine. And, you know, maybe it's the wrong material. There's other times where, your materials will be great and you'll be able to say, oh, well, I just need to work on my technique. Um, but yeah, it, it's one of those things that uh, if you were to try and work it out yourself and figure it out over time, it might take you quite a bit longer than um, to compare notes. And I know that um, having a, a group of tying friends to reach out to, or if you're in the woods uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe you're the only person in your family that ties flies or something. Uh, I was being able to reach out to someone and ask, well, Hey, how do you do this? And knowing that you're going to get an answer that you can work with is invaluable. I, I can't describe, you know, I, I brought up these names a few different times, but John Cooper, Jeff Faulkner and, and Jeremy Boulier, when I was learning how to tie uh, the volume of questions that those guys helped me with, um, probably took 10 years off my learning curve. So uh, make sure that if you do have questions that you take the time to ask them because you'll, you'll be happy you did. So again, my hair is not in, impeded by, uh, or my thread's not impeded by the extra hair in the Buford. So this one actually went nice. And you'll notice that when you're tying this, if, if you've done it just right and you have the right amount of material, your thread will actually kind of, you'll be tying over the back of the eye and your thread will kind of get sucked down into there. Um, that is what you want to happen. You're looking for that sweet spot. Um, I'll try to give an, I'll try to show what that looks like. Um, do the same thing we're doing here. I'm going to take a picture. We'll overlay this just so that you have. So it may look like the eye is a little bit crowded here and it isn't at all, um, in that picture that we just took. So you'll see that as we tighten our thread, that ends up acting as a, a very small thread dam. Um, and you are, I, I'm now pushing against the bases of those fibers. And, and we have a couple different things that we can do to really make sure that that head shape ends where we want it. One of the ways is, you know, if you know that all of your hair is tied in and around, everything's nice and even, um, 
you've wrapped your your thread for your thread head and it kind of pushes everything back uh you know there's times where it all works out great and it's easy but there's other times where you know let's let's use black bucktail in instances where you have a head that's being difficult and it will happen um you can actually after you do your your thread head and your whip finish you can actually do like a, a really small bead of like a, a thick uv and i'll actually do it like i'll do the half top the top half sometimes and I'll cure that and then I'll flip my vice over and I'll do the bottom half. And it ends up acting to hold that Buford head. It's not something that you need to do often. Um, but if you're protecting your thread, you want to, you know, and you're tying a bunch of these and you want to make sure that your, your heads are all going to be completely consistent. Uh, it definitely helps with that. So um, my, my first recommendation is make sure that your tying technique is good because um, you know, depending on the material you're using, you may not need, to do that and i don't actually believe that this one needs it yeah um but don't be afraid to use uv to either protect your thread or to finish a fly in the way that you want it because again you're gonna have more confidence while you're fishing it and that ultimately is gonna you know make you focus better and when that fish eats deep in the eight um, rather than zoning off, maybe you're paying attention because you have confidence in that fly. And that's the difference between you, you know, strip setting and not trout setting and making sure that it all comes together. So I'm really happy with this thread head. Um, again, I'm going to hand whip finish here. There's a number of other videos to do it, but I, you come up and then around and you'll end up with that it's going to be tricky to show off in the video here, but you're going to end up bringing that little hitch up to the eye of the hook. And I'll actually hold my hair out of the way while I'm tying these because there's plenty of times where you'll, you'll end up pulling a, a hair back in through your whip finish and it's a pain in the butt when I have that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if you wanted to go fish this just like it is, you probably don't even have to trim the head. Um, I would trim the first part here just because I, those were a little bit longer when we did the front tie-in on the head. But, um, you know, there's times where you'll cut the hair length before and you don't end up even needing to trim the head before you fish these. Um, doesn't happen often, but it definitely happens sometimes. And we just spent all that time to tie this fly, so I'm going to give it an extra whip finish. Again, keeping my hair out of the way while we do this. Unsuccessfully on that one. So everything is really nice and tight there. I'm happy with that. Um, if you wanted to cut your thread right here uh, and be done with it before you do the head cement, you can. Um, this is an overbuilt step that I like, but I'll actually do um, head cement. I'm using that hardest hole again on this to lock in my head wraps before I cut my thread. Um, and the reason for that is one overkill, um, but two, if you're, if you say you only wanted to do one whipped finish, one whip finish here, uh, what can happen is, you know, maybe your whip finish didn't seat all the way or something like that. And the last thing you would want is for your thread wraps, especially on the head of this fly to come loose on you. So now that I've put a little bit of, of cement there, cut my thread. So now that our head is done, uh, the tying portion at least, uh, now it's time to trim. And I usually do two steps uh, in trimming these heads. Uh, part of what we're doing is one, making sure that all the fibers in the head are the same length. Uh, 
but two, there's a certain shape that I like, um, and, and we'll get a picture of this when it's done. But the best way I've found, I've got this armrest right here, and I've got these curved scissors. These are the uh, Dr. Slick four inch curved scissors. Um, but I will pick what the shape of my head is that I want, and I will hold my vice there. And I've literally, my, my rotary is set such that I can just spin my vice while trimming all the way around. And this is just the rough trim. This is not where we'll end up. So after we do our rough trim here, um, you'll notice, you know, you, if you really wanted, you could just go fish this now. Uh, it, like it, it's pretty good. Uh, I'm extra particular. So what I like to do is uh, take the, now I like to take it out of the vise and just to really dial in the shape of the head that I've been trying to tie here. And you may notice on a Buford, if you're tying it, and, and this one does not, is not as applicable to this fly, but um, say for instance that you had, you know, one really noticeably denser part of the head. If you needed to tie, you know, cut that part, you know, you'd hold your fly like this and you cut that part and maybe be cutting a lot more hair off of one side than the other. As long as the end result is that your Buford head has the same amount of, of hair all around, uh, then you're good. I typically like to have the head slope back the entire way. Like it's got a rounded portion in the very front, but um, that's part of why we tried to have the longer neck part in the first, uh, the first tie in while we had the longer tag ends. And this is a fun part here. If you wanted to, trim out on the sides and actually, you know, glue eyes into this, you could do that. Uh, you know, what you decide you want to do with your Buford um, is entirely up to you. If you did put eyes on this at this point, it, you know, that would be, we're getting into uh, Bill Catherwood giant killer territory. You'll notice there's parts of this where I'm actually leaning this part of the closed blade of the scissors on the hook eye and my my rotary you'll notice is off a little bit um, and that's just because the hook is tilted a little bit but i set this vice before we started tying this fly so that everything was nice and, and even and again this is way overkill like this fly has been done for a few minutes now um, but i like my bufords to have a very specific profile in the head and the body um, and the result is an action that especially in moving water is really hard to beat. Uh, the Buford is a pattern that belongs in every musky fly anglers uh, fly box. So yeah, lemon tail Buford. Uh, thank you everyone for being here for this episode of Tying with the Pros. Uh, it's been an absolute blast making all of these. Uh, on the next episode, we are going to have John Cooper tying the smoker, which is a, a, an evolution of an articulated Buford. Uh, and we're going to start bringing on a bunch of other tires uh, from, you know, different walks of uh, musky and predator fly tying in the community. So uh, thank you again, everyone, for being here for Musky Towns Tying with the Pros. Uh, we're excited to share the next episode with you, too. Uh, we're going to include a materials list here, but if you have any questions about substitutions, techniques, or otherwise, we're always here to help. Mm -hmm.